Well, good afternoon. Thank you for joining us for today's webinar, which is entitled Helping Horses at Risk and in Transition. We're delighted that you were able to join us. We are recording this session, so you'll have an opportunity to play it back if you'd like to hear some of the details uh, um, later on. Um, I'm Julie Broadway, President at the American Horse Council, and I also oversee the American Horse Council Foundation. The foundation is our 501c3 nonprofit um, that was formed out of the need to encourage support for worthwhile charitable, scientific, and educational projects such as the United Horse Coalition and the Equine Welfare Data Collective. So we're delighted to present to you this afternoon. We also would really like to say a special thank you to our sponsors, which are Piranha and Adaptus. And with that, I'd like to introduce Ashley Harkins, our director for the United Horse Coalition. Take it away, Ashley. All right, hey everybody. Um, well, thanks for being here with us today to learn a little bit about uh, some of the resources and programs that are out there today to help horses at risk or in transition. Um, we're going to start today by hearing a little bit about some of the resources provided by the United Horse Coalition, uh, followed by some of the newest data coming out of the Equine uh, Welfare Data Collective. And then we will have a few of our partner um, UHC member organizations speak about their respective programs and what they've been doing recently um, to help at-risk courses. Uh, before we jump into this, I just want to do a quick video from our sponsor today. If everything goes well, hopefully it'll work. We at Peron are very proud to announce that we are now joined the American Horse Council along with our sister company, Adeptus. You know, our beliefs have always been to take care of the horse first, which aligns perfectly with the American Horse Council and that they're there every day fighting for the rights of all breeds and really all disciplines. Here at Piranha, we you know, pride ourselves in taking care of the animals uh, that we love so much. And with Piranha, certainly we take care of those flying and biting insects that aggravate our animals. And so we're very aggressively pursuing the best formulations the Ultimate Protection Collection, for example, our oil base, our water base, our all natural zero bite, and our aerosol. All four of these products in the Ultimate Protection Collection protects our animals, along with our Spraymaster system that is installed in many barns across the country. No matter what breed you have, Adeptus is going to take care of your horse on the inside, and it's certainly going to show on the outside. So with Piranha and Adeptus, just like the American Horse Council, we're going to continue to protect your horse and keep them healthy. So um, for today's webinar, it's, it's my hope that uh, if you're a horse owner, we will get you thinking about some of the things you might not be aware of on how you can help keep your horse um, from becoming at risk. And if you're a rescue who's on the call with us today, um, you know, hopefully you'll be able to utilize some of the programs that we'll be talking about um, to help you with the horses in your care. And also utilize these resources uh, in your conversations with uh, your prospective uh, and your current adopters. Uh, so for some of you, part of this discussion today might be a refresher. Um, but as we are talking about at-risk courses and those in transition today, I like to uh, reiterate what those terms mean for those who might not be aware. Um, so for at-risk, it can be any equine that has an increased possibility of experiencing a situation of neglect, abuse, or uh, general poor welfare. And when we talk about horses that are in transition, it can be any equine that is currently in transition from one home vocation opportunity or uh, owner to the next. So what does an at-risk horse look like? Um, I think, you know, automatically we want to jump to the conclusion that Dakota might look like the obvious choice, but in reality, um, all four of these horses were at risk at one point in their lives. Um, the truth is an at-risk horse can really be any of these examples. A lot of times we automatically think of an at-risk horse as possessing some sort of issue um, or something that 
brought them to the point of being at risk. Maybe he's dangerous or not an easy keeper. Um, you know, maybe he's medically or behaviorally unsound, or maybe he's outlived the purpose uh, for which the owner originally intended for the horse. And all of these can indeed be true. Um, but in reality, for a majority of at-risk horses, uh, they're, they're perfectly normal and healthy and, and have no issues at all. Um, these horses are more often than not just simply a victim of a change in their owner's life circumstance. Um, you know, whether the, the owner lost their job or they're facing medical challenges, or they might be aging out of their ability to uh, properly care for that horse. Uh, just to give you an example, this is a, a picture of my adopted horse, Sammy, uh, who was once considered at risk and part of a large scale neglect case in Massachusetts. Um, and I will say that he is the uh, best horse that I've ever had the pleasure of owning. He's now 26 and semi-retired and um, basically just teaching my girls the joys of being around horses. So without going too much into the history of UHC, I think a lot of you that are with us on the call today are familiar with um, you know, our history and how we, how we came about. Um, but the mission of UHC was and continues to be to promote education and options for at-risk and transitioning equines uh, throughout the industry. And we do this by educating current and future horse owners on responsible ownership, proper care and breeding, um, and responsible options that are available to owners should they no longer be able to care for um, you know, the horse in their care or if they need to rehome their horse. We're raising awareness about the issues that are surrounding horses at risk and also the impact that it has um, on the horse industry itself. And hopefully by doing this, um, we can reduce the number of horses that are at risk uh, so that eventually in a, in a perfect world, we can eliminate the issues that surround them altogether. By far, however, um, I like to, to pull this slide up. Um, our biggest impact in creating change for at-risk horses is by starting at the source. And that's through teaching horse owners how to be responsible for the horses that are in their care. Um, we do this by educating owners about not only responsible uh, care and breeding responsibly, but through providing resources and options to uh, help keep their horse in their home. Or if they can't keep their horse, providing responsible options and alternatives um, for the next chapter of their horse's life. We also want to make sure that owners are thinking about what happens to their horse um, should something happen to them as an owner. So to that end, we provide information regarding uh, estate planning, having an exit strategy for your, your horse um, and safety net program in place, um, you know, to keep your horse safe. And then of course, helping owners um, understand what's involved in end of life decisions, including uh, euthanasia and disposal. And we feel that this important, um, this, this topic is important to be discussed openly because it's something that is gonna happen to every person that's involved with horses at some point in their lifetime. Um, and if we can prepare people, it makes the topic a little less scary and a bit easier to understand what's involved in the process, uh, both when it comes to the euthanasia itself, as well as the disposal. Um, you know, we hope by making the, the subject a little less taboo um, and helping owners become comfortable talking to their veterinarian about making that decision for their horse when and if it's necessary. Uh, from a UH stand, uh, UHC standpoint, Prevention and being a responsible owner is key in helping to uh, keep most horses from reaching an at-risk state and uh, thereby, you know, keeping them not only out of the system, but also safe in their, in their home. So when we talk about our resources uh, for the context of UHC, um, a resource is anything that we can identify that can assist in helping uh, uh, horses that are at risk or preventing them from becoming at risk. There's currently three categories that these resources fall under on our website, resources for current owners, resources for prospective owners, and resources for rescues and sanctuaries. Um, each of these subcategories has its own page on our website dedicated to resources and programs uh, specifically to help them. In addition to what we have listed 
in the equine resource database. Uh, sometimes, as is the case of resources for rescues and sanctuaries, um, we actually direct users and visitors uh, via external links to uh, resources and programs that are provided by some of our member uh, organizations and partners. Which brings me to our bread and butter, um, which is the United Horse Coalition's equine resource database. Um, its impact is huge for its potential to help um, owners of at-risk horses. Um, individuals in need of assistance can come to our site and utilize this basically this type of search engine to find various uh, safety net programs or assistance programs that are listed by uh, that uh, state that we have identified nationwide. Um, this database also includes an audited list of over 1,200 rescues and sanctuaries for owners to reach out to in their search of responsible options um, should they need to rehome their horse. We add and remove resources from this data, database pretty much on a, on a weekly basis um, as they're identified or they're brought to our attention. Um, as a side note, one of the action items for UHC this year is to identify some guidelines to help owners uh, navigate searching for a uh, reputable uh, rescuer or surrender to adopt from. But to give you an example, um, say an owner is in need of feed or hay assistance, or maybe it's euthanasia assistance. Um, what they would do is select that option from the drop down box that you saw on the first page. Um, put in their state and we will populate the results. These are the results here um, with any organizations that we have identified that offer um, that type of assistance program. You can also search by um, breed specific programs or affiliations like GFAS, TAA, STA, and so on. Um, if you're an organization that would like to be added to this database, you're welcome to fill out the database questionnaire on our website. Uh, and we'll get you added in. I should also mention that if you are on our website, um, if you're an owner and you're on our website and you're unable to find the assistance that you're in need of through the database, um, you can always just contact us directly and we'll network with our member organizations to get you the help that you're in need of. Next is our COVID resources. Um, I'm gonna mention the COVID resource site briefly, if only to say that it might be retired soon, which, which is a good thing. Um, and anything that continues to be helpful or that is worth transferring over to our site, um, we'll be adding to the database and resource pages before we take it down. Um, so when you go to the landing page for COVID, there's sections set up by sector. So one for horse owners, one for nonprofits, uh, equine businesses and one for industry employees. Um, the sections that that are on the site include links to articles, websites, information, um, webinars, and, and anything really that we found that would be beneficial to help um, aid individuals during the pandemic. So we'll slowly be phasing out of that. Um, I'd like to talk a little bit about our educational materials. Uh, we have a vast array of educational materials on our website. And these are for not only our members to utilize, um, but the general public as well. They're, they're there for everyone to use at will. Um, we have an owning responsibly booklet, which contains all the materials and topics on responsible ownership of everything you wanna know about being a responsible owner. It's available in PDF form. Um, and it's, it's really, it can be a great tool for not only owners, but um, if you're a rescue for your potential adopters and new horse owners, uh, even current ones, as there's information in there, you know, I'm, I'm fairly certain a lot of owners haven't really thought about. Uh, we have a brochure on neglect on the neglected horse, rehabilitating the neglected horse. Uh, information on is horse ownership right for me? So should I be taking lessons? Should I try leasing first? Or am I really ready to dive on in and become a horse owner? Um, we have an owning response, own, own response, our responsible breeding brochure, um, information on finding the right horse, so information on how to responsibly acquire your next horse, um, responsible options for owners who can't keep their horse any longer, 
estate planning, which is super important. It's something a lot of people don't think about, um, but it's really, it's just incredibly important to, to think about that and include your horse in your estate plan. Um, and then of course, you know, information on end of life decisions and euthanasia, um, as well as disposal options for equines. We also do uh, infographics as well for just any current topics that are going on. Um, we just add them, add them to our site for anybody to use. So again, if, if, if any of these materials would be useful to you or your organization, um, you know, please feel free to utilize them. So this was on our plan for last year to complete. Um, it is still getting an, an update and an overhaul, uh, but we're just continuing that for 2021. We hope to have this done soon. Um, I'm, I'm hoping within the next month or two. Uh, this booklet was originally put together to help industry organizations and individuals um, institute activities and programs to help at-risk horses and those in transition. It's a means for us um, as an organization to share what other organizations and individuals are already doing to be, uh, be able to provide guidance and ideas to others about how uh, they can jump on board and implement these programs as well. To add to that, um, one of the other projects that we are working on is a new owner packet. Um, again, this was, was started last year and we're continuing that for this year. Um, whoops, sorry about that. And uh, basically what this packet is going to include is, is some form of the responsible ownership materials we have on our website. Um, our goal is to have these packets available for distribution pretty much anywhere that a horse changes hands. So this could be at adoption facilities, sales barns, breeding barns, um, options, and so on. And the purpose is to try and promote responsible ownership before the horse changes hands. Um, so that each owner has the tools in place that they need to make responsible decisions uh, on their horse's behalf. One of the things that we spoke about uh, during our recent committee meetings was the possibility of collaborating with other organizations to create um, standardized guidelines and best practices to help organizations implement certain types of safety net programs. Um, this would allow us to take tried and true practices that other organizations have established and share them with other organizations who do not um, currently offer these types of programs, but are interested in doing so in the future. Um, it's our hope by increasing these types of programs nationwide, we can increase access for owners who are, are in need of, of these types of programs. A few of the guidelines and best practices um, to standardize that we had in mind are um, gelding clinics and castration clinics, euthanasia and disposal clinics, hay and feed assistance programs, um, and training and behavioral assistance programs. Um, so, you know, so be on the lookout for uh, development coming out of this. So to close out my, my spiel, I wanna let you know about some of the things that you can do um, on a personal level to help at-risk horses. Number one important thing is to, of course, look out for the horse in your own backyard. So own responsibly. Um, have contingency plans in place for your horse, which includes, it includes including them in your estate planning. Have an exit strategy and a safety plan spelled out in place for your horse if something happens to you. Um, if you breed, obviously it goes without saying breed responsibly. If you're an organization, join the UHC ambassador program or become a member. Uh, if you are an individual, um, volunteer at your local rescue or rehoming facility. Donate or hold a fundraiser in their honor. Uh, and the easiest thing that you can do would be obviously to, to share the UHC materials on our website um, on responsible ownership with your horse friends and your coworkers. We, meaning uh, collectively, we can't help owners if they aren't aware of what exists out there. Uh, to help them keep their horse safe. And then be a part of the solution. So if you work in the industry, consider designating one person uh, for your organization to spearhead the effort in talking about at-risk horses. 
and um, take a look at the UHC Join the Effort Handbook for ideas on how your organization can become more involved. Um, one of the simple activities uh, to, that you can do is to dedicate a small section of your website to the UHC and resources for owners so that your membership base knows that these resources exist for them to access in their time of need. Um, but most importantly, aim to find common ground and work together to prevent horses from becoming at risk. Uh, if you're not already a member of UHC, consider be becoming a part of us and spread the word about owning responsibly. And with that, I am going to turn the conversation over to my colleague, uh, Emily Stearns, the program director of the Equine Welfare Data Collective. Hello, everybody. So my name is Emily Stearns. I'm the program manager for the Equine Welfare Data Collective. Um, and this is a program of the United Horse Coalition that's been going on for a couple of years now. You can go ahead and move forward, Ash. And basically, as part of the United Horse Coalition, our mission is to provide data analysis that is critical to understanding more about horses who are currently at risk and in transition. So these are horses that are currently in rescues or being rehomed through direct placement programs, finding assistance through safety net programs. And this data that's critical is then used to kind of help the industry and the equine welfare community at large identify ways to kind of create and grow programming, um, direct funding and support and kind of in general help drive positive change as we all work towards supporting at-risk courses and those in transition. Next slide, Ash. So we've accomplished several things and the Equine Welfare Data Collective, our main goal is to collect this data um, and then publish the information to the public free of charge. So everybody can kind of look at the data analysis and the reports and help identify how best they can help their own community and support their own community. So what we've done over the past couple of years is we've helped to build this database of over 1000 equine welfare organizations in the country. And, and this in part is um, what we use to help kind of understand that there even was a need for the equine resource database within the UHC because there was no master list of all the great organizations that were helping people across the country. So we worked with Ashley to help build this list. And the data that we're reporting right now, we have data from about 30% of the equine welfare population. So over 300 organizations have submitted data to us so far, and, and that list is continuing to grow. We currently have two published reports on the UHC website right now. And our third report is coming very soon. It's, it's going to our reviewer this week. Um, so our third report will be published very soon. And you can read those reports free on the UHC website. We also have an ambassador program to help orgs who do not kind of operate normally within the welfare community at large or orgs that don't take custody of horses, but that do kind of good works within the welfare community. One of them is the Global Federation of Animal Sanctuaries that works to certify and set standards for animal sanctuaries. But this ambassador program helps to kind of spread the good word of data and share our reports among their affiliates. And, and we're kind of always growing that ambassador program. We also have an intern program. If you know any studious high schoolers or college students who want to be more involved in equine welfare, we have a remote internship program. And through our data and analysis and reporting, we've identified um, a critical need among equine welfare organizations to be supported in not only their data reporting, but their record keeping needs. So we've started kind of identifying ways. Um, one of them was through educational webinars to help support equine welfare organizations um, with animal shelter software learning and better record keeping needs. Next slide, Ash. So before we talk about the data a little bit, I always like to kind of tell people how it works and it, it is very straightforward. So what we do is that's a picture of me, myself um, and our interns, we get on the phone, we call equine welfare organizations, we email equine welfare organizations and we encourage them to submit data to us through a survey software um, system and then 
we analyze that data and we report it through our reports. The data stays private, so we don't publish any raw data. We only publish aggregated analysis. Um, and we feel that's a very important aspect of data collection and, and kind of getting this understanding of equine welfare out into the world because organizations have a right to keep their data private. So we wanna make sure that any reporting and analysis we do helps to protect the identity of any org submitting data. We don't want their information out there unless they feel like sharing it. Next slide, Ash. So some of the data that we've been, <laughs> thank you, Daryl. Some of the data that we have been really excited to share is, is something we identified in our second report is the national capacity. And, and what we were able to identify through a robust sample size is that the daily capacity, so this is the number of essentially stalls available to help horses every day in equine welfare organizations is nearly 50,000. So on any given day, there are nearly 50,000 stalls that can be filled with horses at need or at risk or in transition. And this doesn't tell us a lot yet about how many horses every year are receiving help because that's very dependent on length of stay, which is actually some information we're working to identify in our next report that's coming out. But if we think about all of the horses at risk and in need and, and needing help, this kind of general understanding that on any given day, there's 50,000 horses that could be helped is, is a really huge statistic to think about. Next slide, Ash. So something, and, and this is kind of a sneak peek of our report data. This has been verified by our um, third party analyst, but not a reviewer yet. So, you know, take this all with a little grain of salt. I'd like to have faith that it's correct, but as of right now, until it comes back with the seal of approval, you know, take everything with a grain of salt. But all of these horses that are seeking help, you know, why do they need help? That's always a really big question. And in terms of the UHC and working to help prevent horses from becoming at risk and help prevent horses from ending up in a home that might not be a good match for them or, or needing to rely on funding support that might not be there, you know, one big thing is where are these horses coming from that are in these organizations and ending up in custody of these organizations? What is leading to these horses being there? So we got responses from over 170 welfare organizations and we asked them how many requests for assistance for rehoming they got in a one year period and how many they were able to fulfill. And these 170 organizations reported over 7,000 requests for rehoming in one year collectively. Um, so this is that's a huge number, right? So there's 7,000 horses that that were reaching out, 7,000 owners reaching out to these organizations saying, "We need help. We need help rehoming." And so we asked these organizations what reasons they were receiving. What were the most common reasons they were receiving for these horses needing new homes? And going down the list, we had equine health, equine age, equine behavior, owner relocating, so the owner was moving, owner finances, owner health, and owner age. And then, you know, you always stick that other in just in case there's anything you don't think of. And of the 178 organizations that responded, 77%, so if you look at the chart to the right with the orange and blue bars, kind of breaking it down into two general categories, horse-related needs and owner-related needs, over 75% of all the organizations that responded said the owner related issues were why these horses were needing homes. Um, so over, you know, a large portion of these organizations said the owners need help. It's these are not horse reasons that people need help. It's owners. They're lost their job. They're unwell. They're too old. They're moving. Owners are reaching out to us. Um, and 50% said, you know, it's horse related, it might be age, it might be behavior. Behavior was one of the, the lower regions. If you look at um, the light blue bar, kind of the fourth bar down, only about 16% of all the organizations said that horse behavior was a reason for the horse needing a home. Um, equine health, about 33%, so about a third of all organizations said, you know, equine health was one of the top reasons and about 30% said equine age was one of the top reasons. But kind of, you know, it's one of those things if you've worked in rescue and, and Ashley and I have both had, you know, hands-on work working in equine rescues, 
owner finances seems always kind of like one of those duh moments. Yeah, obviously the horses need help because the owners need help. You know, they've lost their jobs, they've lost their whatever. Um, but to see it so clearly laid out like this, you know, really speaks to owner finances seems like a way we can all all reach out and kind of try to problem solve. So if the owner finances need help, maybe hay banks will help, maybe gelding assistance will help, maybe vet assistance will help. So it's just kind of nice to be able to, to have the data to back up all these great programs that are kind of operating out there that some of the um, next panelists are gonna talk about. I have to unmute myself. Um, thank you, Em, for that. And next up, I will call on Keith Klein, uh, who is the Director of the Industry Relations at the American Association of Equine Practitioners and the uh, Foundation for the Horse. Keith, take it away. Great. Thank you, Ashley. I appreciate everybody joining today. Um, I'm going to talk about two programs that uh, AEP, uh, the first one, participates with one of our uh, very important educational partners, Merck Animal Health. And then the second program is managed through the Foundation for the Horse, uh, which is the charitable arm of the AAEP. Um, about the Unwon Horse Veterinary Relief Campaign, uh, this program, you can go ahead and switch to the next one, Ashley. Um, this program has been around since 2008. And again, as it mentions here, is a joint partnership with Merck. And we provide vaccines uh, to qualified equine rescue and retirement facilities. So we celebrated uh, 10 years for this program and uh, continue to work with them on this. Um, next slide, please. Um, each facility, uh, as you can see here, some history on it. Since 2009, we've uh, distributed more than 42,000 doses uh, to the uh, facilities. Next slide. Uh, each of the equine uh, facilities that apply, they must be 501c3s. And we have an annual application uh, time period. We used to do this twice a year, uh, but we found um, based on the numbers and time periods and available uh, doses that Merck has, that February 1st has worked very well. Um, and upon approval, we then work with Merck and their uh, team uh, for distribution. And vaccines typically arrive uh, about a month, month after uh, March, March 1 or so. So it's pretty turnkey. Um, the facilities don't have to provide tons of data. Um, next slide, please. We do have them work with um, their veterinarian and there is an application. And so any support information um, that they can provide, it, it allows us uh, to know more and provide data um, to help improve what's happening for some of these uh, unwanted at-risk horses in transition. So here's a web link uh, for those of you that are unaware of the program. I think most facilities are, but if you're not, feel free to access this web link and you can learn more about the program. Next slide, Ashley. So moving on to another program that's managed uh, through the foundation, um, this is called Vet Direct Safety Net. And it's designed to give a little bit of help to horse owners that need some veterinary care for their animals. Next slide, please. What this program does, thanks to a partnership and generous gift that we received from our friends over at ASPCA, it allows uh, veterinarians to work with horse owners to assist them if needed with euthanasia and disposal, but hopefully most times it's for emergency stabilization procedures. And there may be uh, an owner that needs a little bit of help. So the ultimate goal of this program is we want owners to keep their animals, to keep them health, healthy and safe. And if a little bit of financial help 
working with the AP member veterinarian uh, is going to help make that happen. That is the ultimate goal of this program. We want owners to keep their animals um, because the owner, for the most part, is going to be the best one uh, to, to care for them. So there may be times, you know, during COVID when somebody lost uh, lost their job and need a little bit of help. Um, the veterinarians will work with them and uh, each each veterinarian uh, has access to a certain amount of dollars and each horse um, has access to up to about $600. But again, the veterinarian will work with the owner based on that need and that owner and that animal. Next slide, please. It's easy to connect. Um, as mentioned, uh, they do need to be an AP member. Um, if they're not part of the program, they need to have uh, their veterinarian become an AP member. Um, so as it mentions here, if you know of somebody that has a horse or a person that needs help, have them connect with their veterinarian. And then if they're not a veterinarian, have them become a member and it's easy to join. Um, and if they are already, then if the member is not signed up for the vet direct program, it's a quick call to Sue or an email. She'll tell them the, the information. There's an onboarding process that takes very little time, a few forms, and then they're golden. They're signed up for the program. And then as they learn of horses or owners in need, then they're able to participate in the program. So it's pretty simple and we, you know, would love more veterinarians to participate. So thanks again to our friends at ASPCA and AP uh, for their assistance and partnership with the foundation for this program. I think that may be our final slide there. So quick and dirty, it's, these are both great programs and happy to answer any questions in the Q&A or later on. Thanks, Keith, for coming on. Um, okay, so next up we have uh, Christy Shelty Cappert, who is the program director of the Right Horse Initiative, which is a program of the ASPCA, um, and her colleague Kaylin Caldwell. So, Tex, take it away. Thank you, Ashley. So good to be here with you all today. Um, hopefully, you have heard of the Right Horse Initiative already, but if not, um, we're happy to provide a quick overview and some updates of how the program's been going. Next slide, please. The Right Horse is really a, a collective. It is more than just the ASPCA. It is a group of equine industry and welfare professionals and advocates. And we're all working together to massively increase horse adoption because we see adoption as such a powerful way to not only connect the right people with their right horse, but also enable rescues and shelters to help more horses to be there for the horses who do need them uh, for rehoming. Next slide, please. We have seen a pretty significant growth in our partners over the last few years. The Right Horse was founded in 2016, uh, and we are up to almost 60 industry partners now, groups like the UHC, like the AEP and the Foundation for the Horse, um, many of you here, and uh, also companies like pharmaceuticals, uh, Zoetis and Beringer Engelheim, uh, media companies like Horse Illustrated and Western Horsemen, and breed and discipline associations like PATH International, CHA. And what all of these industry partners bring is uh, these really diverse perspectives and expertise to help increase adoption in different ways. We of course also have 34 adoption partners. These are the groups who are shelters and rescues actively taking in horses and helping place them in their new homes. And then a little over 30 warm up bring organizations who are those working towards becoming a full adoption partner. And we support those partners in a, a lot of different ways, generating and channeling the support from industry partners to them. Uh, we provide grants and then we provide lots of uh, collaboration and education and, and sharing of problem solving, which makes each group uh, much stronger because they can learn from their colleagues who share those same goals. Another, next slide, please. Something to put on your radar for this year, uh, we are convening all of the Right Horse partners and we'll have an opportunity for those interested in becoming partners to come to the Right Horse Summit. It will be back in person this year, thankfully. We're so excited to see everyone together. 
and will be uh, in Denver in mid-September. So stay tuned for more info and registration on that coming very soon. Um, you can always reach out. I'll put my email in chat after this uh, if you uh, would like to learn uh, more info about the summit and be notified as soon as registration is open. And that's really where we come together to talk about these ideas and share problem solving and help each other and um, collaboration and education around uh, these, these ideas and ways to increase adoptions. So uh, uh, next slide, please. Thank you. Um, our partners had a banner year in 2020. I know everyone was a little worried about what, what the year would bring, and they actually adopted out over 3,600 horses, which is a pretty incredible number of horses who found their right home. Next slide, please. And that's actually a 21% increase over the prior year. So what we're seeing is these groups really leaning in, focusing on their adoptions, getting really smart and really effective at matching the right horse with the right person. And we've actually seen um, a, 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 at least a 20%, anywhere from the high teens to the high 20s percentage increase in adoptions every year since the right horses started. So that's been really encouraging to see the incredible demand that folks have for these adoptable horses. We're uh, all of the work that UHC and our partners are doing to change people's minds about who these horses are and help them see their next partner at a shelter, it's working. So we think the sky's the limit on, on how many horses we can help through adoption. And then that's been very encouraging and exciting to see. Next slide, please. Another way that we help Horses in Transition as a brand new program this year. It's called the ASPCA Horse Adoption Express. And as you may have guessed, it's a transport program. One of the barriers we kept hearing over and over was sometimes the right horse was in the wrong place. And so if their adopter or potential adopter was out of state, that could be the one thing that would make the adopter say, dang, I'm just not sure how I can make this work. And so the Horse Adoption Express transports horses between our adoption partners to areas of higher demand where that horse might be more able to find his home more quickly or to a place where that horse can get training that he needs to become adopted or uh, for any other reason that might make him more able to find his right person at a different shelter. And so this is something that you, know, uh, you may have heard has been done for many years in um, the small animal world and has been incredibly successful at saving lives. And so by removing this barrier, we're, uh, we're already seeing the impact and able to help lots and lots of horses find their, their right people. So that's a few examples of how we've supported our partners and helped increase adoptions. And I'll pass it over to Kaylin to talk about some of the marketing aspects of the Right Horses work. Thank you. So as Christy just said, the Right Horse Initiative is working with all these incredible groups to grow capacity and build programming that helps more horses. And on the other side, we work to grow the demand for adoption so that these horses have homes that they can transition into. We've had a lot of success and we tell these stories of adoptable horses um, in a variety of different ways on an ongoing basis through social media, through highlighting positive adoption successes, as well as um, working with our industry partners to weave adoption into industry communications as just another way to acquire a horse. Um, we've had a lot of momentum building and a lot of excitement around adoption over these last few years, which is reflected in those numbers that Christy just shared. And we're kind of at a point where we know we're um, growing momentum and wanted to step adoption into the spotlight in a new way. Um, so we just launched this year for the first time, Adopt a Horse Month, and I know many of you guys on the call have been instrumental in making this event a success, so um, congratulations to everyone. We kicked it off on April 26th, which was the pre-existing Help a Horse Day, and there was already a lot of public recognition and awareness around helping horses on that day, and then transitioned us into this massive celebration of equine adoption, where we brought it to the public forefront through working with our media partners to tell the stories of these horses and maybe break down some of those misperceptions about what an adoptable horse is and help them realize that adoptable horses are just another wonderful population of horses that are no different than those on the general market um, and just have had a different set of circumstances that have brought them to where they are. We have worked with celebrities. We have reached out to the ASPCA membership, which is a another massive audience of horse lovers, animal lovers, and horse owners, and educated them about what we're doing in horse adoption. 
and we're getting early results back. Of course, we're still in the tail end of adopt a horse month, but um, we've seen an increase in inquiries and people looking to adopt a horse. And uh, on our website, we've had over 35,000 people go online looking to find their right horse. So that's a pretty exciting number um, in unique users going online. Next slide. So where we're driving them is our adoptable horse listing site, My Right Horse. We want to reduce all the friction as possible when people are looking to adopt a horse. So we created one platform um, with the end user in mind that lists adoptable horses from all around the country. Individuals looking to adopt or explore adoption can search by age, they can search by breed, location, discipline, suitability. Um, and it was created with the goal of representing these horses in a very professional and positive way and making this process really enjoyable. The horses listed on My Right Horse come from our partner and warm up ring organizations. And then during campaigns like Adopt a Horse Month, we occasionally have additional groups listing their horses. Next slide. So we've had this incredible momentum both leading up to Adopt a Horse Month and this moment during Adopt a Horse Month where we know things are changing forever for at-risk horses. And the really exciting thing is everybody can play a role in the outcome and helping these horses. So the first thing, um, if you guys are listening and are not a partner of the Right Horse Initiative but think you'd be a great fit, I encourage you to reach out to Christy and learn more about what that entails and um, how you can get involved in this incredible collaborative program. And also think about the organizations that you touch. Um, if there's an equine organization or breed organization, um, a business, encourage them to reach out and learn more. It's hard to overstate the value of what word of mouth does for adoptable horses because for the right horse to find the right person, that person at first has to be aware that that horse exists. So we always encourage people to visit My Right Horse, share horses with their local communities online, talk to your farrier, talk to your vet, talk to your trainer and make them aware about equine adoption and the Right Horse Initiative. And then we'd always love for you to follow us on the Right Horse uh, platforms on Instagram and Facebook. That's where we have programmatic updates, um, updates about available horses, what our incredible partners are doing. Um, so please give us a follow if you haven't. And then lastly, we'll just plug Summit again, stay in touch, keep talking to us, and we hope you'll get involved in the Right Horse Initiative and massively increasing horse adoption. Thank you, Kaylin. All right, so our final speaker of the day, um, I'd like to present Carly Barrick, who is the new program manager for um, our partner organization, A Home for Every Horse. So you're up, you, Carly. <laughs> uh, can you hear me well? You're good. good. Yeah. Awesome, thank you. You can start with the next slide. All right, so briefly, um, our mission is a resource for 501c3s, um, and we get a lot of help from um, Ashley and Julie with UHC and AHC. Um, they definitely make my life easier and help me with, you know, getting all the things done and getting all these amazing resources to rescue sanctuary and care facilities. Um, our mission is to provide support for these organizations through our sponsors, and like I said, Ashley and Julie um, help me um, gather and distribute these resources. Um, our, we were founded in 2011, so this year is our 10 year anniversary and our tracking, metric tracking began 2014. So this just shows like a little bit of our growth from 2014 to 2020 um, in our website traffic and our social media following just as a, a starter. Next slide, Ash. Thank you. So our title sponsor is Purina and in short, they supply um, over $150,000 worth of feed each year to shelters. This is the, as we know, the kind of the most expensive part of owning horses, um, especially for rescues and shelters and sanctuaries is it's feeding these horses. Um, and especially horses in need or that are malnourished or struggling. Um, nutrition is, is a big part of getting them healthy. Um, so this is the biggest part of what this sponsorship does. And we actually just sent out um, over 365 packets with these feed coupons, um, thanks to UHC, um, just this week. Next slide, Ash. And these are our other sponsors. Um, Weatherbeta, in short, provides blankets for new uh, horse owners. So every horse adopted through a Home for Every Horse rescues um, gets a new blanket. 
um, which is a little bit of how they help um, new owners get started uh, and then absorbing um, supplies um, coupons for their products and this year mainly is their focus on the silver honey wound care for rescue horses um, purchased. And then Tractor Supply has done a lot of different things. Um, most recently we have a video on our website of them helping provide water troughs to wild horses in Arizona that were going through a rough drought. And UHC, like I said, um, sends these valuable resource packets to the rescues as well as all the educational resources that Ashley went over. Next slide, Ash. So here's what our website looks like, a homeforeveryhorse.com. Um, we like to share success stories, also resources, um, news videos, a little bit more about each of our sponsors. And then our adoptable horses link uh, will link you to our equine.com website, which will be on the next slide, Ash. or I guess we'll do newsletters first. Equine.com will be next, but newsletters, um, this is just kind of a support. So we have a rescue one and a support one. They each have a little bit of an educational blurb from each sponsor. And then the rescue newsletters will have kind of uh, what's happening now. So for example, this next one will say, you know, packets were sent out, you know, keep an eye on your mailing. Um, and then the support newsletter will have a success story. So you'll see on that first slide, um, it's a long story about, you know, these horses that were found on the side of the road and kind of what their life looked like until finding their new homes, as well as um, featured a home for every horse horses. So our horses, um, we like to advertise across all our equine network brands. So we will try and pick, um, you know, breed or discipline specific horses from our rescues that match, you know, across practical horsemen or horse and rider and so that we can have a featured horse for each brand so that we have a lot, our whole equine network audience is seeing these available horses. Okay, next slide. So here's our website. And this is another one of the benefits of being a Home for Every Horse member is that you get to post all of your rescue horses for free on this website. Um, so, and this is inclusive of UHC members because they automatically become a Home for Every Horse members as well. So once they go through our membership process, then I go in through the website and clear them as a rescue and they can, they kind of have, um, you know, endless supply of horses that they can post on here um, is our way of trying to, you know, help broaden who sees these animals and kind of help the cost a little bit on the rescue side of things as well. Okay, next slide. Awesome, thank you. If there's any questions, let me know. I can even put my personal email in the chat if anyone has questions or wants to reach out. Like I said, I'm new, but I'm more than happy to help um, any of the programs or rescues in any way possible. Um, so yeah, thank you, Ash. Thanks, Arlie. Okay, that is um, our webinar for today. If there is time, it looks like we have a couple of minutes. If anybody has any questions, feel free to put them in the chat box. We'll answer them. Um, also, feel free to email any of the speakers today uh, for follow-up questions on any of the programs that you saw. Um, we will, we are recording this webinar, and we will make it available on the UHC website for people to share with your members. We'll share it on our social media um, just to get the word out about about all the good work that's being done right now. Um, so, thank you, everyone, for being here with us today. I'm just answering a question in um, the Q&A, Ash, so just keep the link open for a couple minutes. Oh, sure, yep. Oh, I don't have the Q&A pulled up. That's why I can't see it. Whoops. So, Ashley, while we're waiting, I want to take the opportunity to let the audience know that we are um, having our annual conference virtually this year, June the 14th through the 18th. Thursday the 17th is our Equine Welfare Day. Um, and so if there's an opportunity to hear more from UHC, and she's got some great speakers lined up for that uh, presentation too. And if you have youth involved in any of your organizations, uh, June the 24th, we are offering a youth virtual fly-in where youth members can learn more about the legislative and regulatory things that we manage at the AHC and get an opportunity to meet congressional members and talk to congressional staffers about Things that are going on in the industry. So look for more information about both of those things and we hope you join us.